good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus walked me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious this church this morning. We're thrilled that you're here to join us in worship. Thanks for being here. If you're here this morning and you're visiting with us, we want to especially extend a warm welcome to you and invite you to get to know us a little better. And if you're looking for a church home, perhaps, we would also invite you to stop by the um, Community Life Desk, kind of information center there in the foyer. We'd love to pass on some information for you that could help you just, again, get to know Sunrise a little bit better. We are on kind of the, the verge of the Easter season, and we're thrilled to get to celebrate again this year. It's a joy that we as the body of Christ can gather to uh, remember all that which happened and took place during that remarkable Passion Week leading up to the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we just want to remind us as a body what that will look like here at Sunrise for us. So I just want to run down for you all the kind of the schedule that we'll have for that week. Now it's a couple weeks away yet, but it's coming so you won't, you want to get these on your calendar. The first event that we'll have is a Maundy Thursday service. Okay, not Monday, not Monday Thursday. That's what I probably thought it was growing up. It was a Maundy Thursday service. And, and what we're going to do during that time is we're going to use that time to pray together. So it'll be the first of the month, our regular monthly prayer gathering here in the sanctuary. But we're also going to incorporate our communion time into that uh, gathering together. Okay, so that'll be Thursday evening at, not this Thursday, the following Thursday, um, April 1st at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary, okay? So you'll want to come and be part of that to pray together and take communion together. We'll kind of be tracking through that upper room discourse time that Jesus had with his disciples, uh, John 13, 14, 15, 16 in there, okay? And so we'll kind of be tracking through that, praying through that, and then we'll, we'll, we'll put communion in there and incorporate that in the time together. So it'll be a sweet time to be together. I hope you'll participate in that. The next night, Friday, we will gather for our regular Good Friday service that we'll have again here in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock. That'll be a time where we'll sing together, we'll worship together, and we'll have time to reflect on the scripture passages, particularly the events of Jesus Christ's arrest and, arrest and crucifixion. Okay, so that'll be Good Friday. And then we will gather again here on Easter Sunday morning to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, we'll have three services on Easter Sunday because we want to just uh, have some space to invite the community in to be part of that service. So we'll have this service, 830. We'll have our 10 o'clock service, right? Yes. And then we'll do another one at 1130. Uh, after that, okay? So three services in a row that we'll get to do that Sunday. So keep those on your mind, put them on your calendar because you want to be part of those. Now, um, typically what we've done for years during the Easter Sunday uh, celebration is we have taken uh, a time frame in there to raise money for the Guadalajara 
uh, sorry, the, yes, the Guadalajara Youth Mission Trip team, okay? And we've done that by having a big <coughs> Easter Sunday breakfast. We, we are not going to do that this year, but we are going to um, incorporate some other pieces when it comes to fundraising. And so I want to go down those with you. We will, on that Sunday morning, we will have kind of breakfast pastries and snacks available to uh, donate for, okay? So suggested donations of three, four hundred dollars for a muffin would be fantastic, okay? So, um, so that's going to be happening on Easter Sunday morning during those services. That'll all be out here in the foyer. As well, if you remember from past years, the uh, centerpieces for those Easter Sunday breakfast tables, those flowers that have been given um, from, uh, I think Pacific Growers, I think, does that. We are going to have those again this year, but we're going to have those available for donation for you to use on your Easter Sunday uh, meal table, okay? So those will be here. Again, donations for those things would be great. The third thing that's going to be in place that we're actually ramping up now is this Easter egg hunt plan that's, uh, that's in action. Now, here's the deal with this, okay? It's, these are uh, bags of, oh man, I should have had the bag with me, but it's right out here in the foyer. You can see it. You can sign up for these, but it's a bag of 10 eggs, right? Is it 10 or 12 eggs? 10 eggs in the bag, and each egg is going to have a piece of candy in it, but as well, it's going to have a verse from the resurrection story of Jesus Christ, okay? So this is how it has worked for the Weta family in the past. We, f we first did this. I think Amy came up with this as an idea years ago. We were living uh, up on D Street in Blaine, and we invited our neighbors down for an Easter egg hunt. And so throughout kind of the next hour or so, all of the kids hunted all over the property for these Easter eggs. And as they open them up, they're pulling out these scripture passages, and then they would take them on this kind of big piece of poster board or whatever, and they'd glue them on to this poster board in order of the resurrection story. So that by the time they found all the eggs, they had the resurrection story all lined out there. And it gave us the opportunity to share the resurrection story of Jesus Christ with our neighbors. It was a remarkable opportunity and event. We did it a couple times. So we, um, the youth mission team, I should say, we, our mission team here at Sunrise, put this idea together to share with you all and your neighbors and your communities and your friends. So it's there, but we need you to sign up for them because there's some prep work that'll need to be done. They'll be available for you on Easter Sunday morning, but we need you to sign up today. Probably last minute signups next Sunday, we'll see. But um, we need you to sign up. I would say get five, six, seven of them and be prepared to give them away to people to have Easter egg hunts in their yards. Grandparents, get them for your grandkids. Um, great opportunity, great gift opportunity, okay? So those are available, $10 minimum donation. Feel free to go more than that. We're sending this team to Guadalajara, folks, okay? Um, so take part in that. Be sure and sign up for that this morning, and, um, and you won't regret it. It'll be a great, uh, great opportunity. So what I want to do for us now, I want to pray for us, and then we're going to continue to worship together this morning, shall we? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, We come to you, Almighty God in heaven, in awe of the fullness of who you've revealed yourself to be to us through Scripture, through the sending of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, through his death, his resurrection, his ascension back to your right hand, where right now in these days that we live on this earth, he lives to intercede for us. We gather, Father in heaven, to worship you for all of those pieces. Father in heaven, we don't come into this space lightly. We come into this space, Father, maybe some folks with heavy hearts. We come into this space with a readiness. Maybe some come into this space with an unpreparedness to meet you. But God, no matter how we come into this space, Father, we want to come in here To, to listen to your spirit, 
So, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would descend upon this space. That you, by your Spirit, God in heaven, would, would, um, would touch in with our spirit and speak the words of truth to us through these songs that we get to sing, through the message of truth from your word that Pastor Charlie Worley will share shortly, Father in heaven. Even, Father, through giving as we get to give of the gifts that we've come prepared to give, God in heaven. May your spirit lead us in this time, Father in heaven. I want to take this chance as well, God, just to pray over the Matthews family. I want to pray, God in heaven, for Alex. Father, as, as they as a family kind of walk through this brand new season now as, as they work through some of these pieces of Alex's health, God, I pray that you would give them wisdom. God, I pray that you would uh, grant them peace and patience with one another as they learn what it is to work through this diabetes thing and, 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 and just the parts of that, Father in heaven. And God, we ask that you would be merciful to them. Father, we pray that you would uh, just encourage Alex's heart in this season. That you will get the glory in it all. Father, we love you. Lead us in worship now. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with us. It is. 
It's uh, my privilege this morning to introduce to you Pastor Charlie Worley. And I've realized that, uh, Charlie, you and I have some things in common. We've both been married 47 years. Uh, he's been married to his wife, Marty, right here. We both have um, three children. I think that's right. Okay. Uh, you have four grandchildren. I have almost four grandchildren. Okay. Um, and... Uh, we're both kind of coaches. He's written a, a book here called Creating Ch Ministry Champions, Introduction to Developing and Coaching Leaders for Churches 
and Christian organizations. Charlie has served with the Evangelical Free Church for uh, many years. Oh, I guess the kids can be dismissed for children's church. Sorry about that. <laughs> I see they go anyway. So I don't. <laughs> um, he's been with Evangelical, Evangelical Free Church his whole life, and I've been with, with Converge Church. And these are like sister denominations, really same heritage and everything. And he's been involved in church planting and coaching. And he's been a great coach for our staff. And I'm, we're excited, Charlie, you're going to share the word with us this morning. And I'd like to pray for you. Dear Father, I just want to thank you for Charlie, this good friend who's been a friend to, to, to me and our staff and many in this church who served you well. And we pray, Lord, that you will, your Holy Spirit, you will fill him and use him this morning to challenge us, to teach us, to lead us this morning. Thank you what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you, Pastor Bob. I want to thank the whole staff here for their support. We have a great church, by the way. Uh, not many churches have the staff that Sunrise has. And uh, we need to be always grateful and remember to thank them every chance you get. Ministry today is not easy. This COVID issue has created real problems in churches because pastors have had to do things they were not trained for, not prepared for, and yet, they're pastors, and they're serving the Lord and serving you and us as we work together. So I just want to encourage you to take opportunities to give thanks every chance you get to our staff. And thank God for this church. We're going to dig in a little bit into the Old Testament today. And uh, the Old Testament... And the New Testament are my favorite parts of the Bible. <laughs> As we do that, we're going to talk about symbols. Symbols are very important. And there are so many different symbols. There are many of them in the church. And many of them in our faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Just a few days ago, we celebrated communion. A great symbol that our Lord Jesus gave to us. And other symbols, of course, that we celebrate and we look forward to and we remember. And that's a big part of symbols. They help us remember something or someone. And I want us to reflect today upon a particular symbol that we'll look at. When I think of symbols, I think of when I was 13 years old. When I was 13, my dad passed away from a severe heart attack. 13 years old. It was a difficult time. We went through that funeral service. And my dad was a veteran. So part of that funeral service was a great symbol. It's called Old Glory the flag of our country, the United States. And that flag was draped over the casket of my dad. I can never forget that. I will always remember that symbol of his service, of our country, and what it means. You're probably uh, as aware as I am of just recently, over the past couple of years, there's been a lot of issues surrounding protests that athletes have done in their schools and how they have taken the opportunity at games and other things to display certain protests that they have. But I'll always remember what that flag means to us. And maybe you have a loved one too that has been buried but first, as the wonderful flag of the United States was draped over their coffin. Well, that's just one symbol, and there are many others. I want to think this morning about a particular symbol that means a lot to me and probably to you. It's a symbol that as we preach in this church, whoever stands 
behind this particular pulpit or in this church as they preach or teach, they're literally standing under it. And I invite your attention with me just to look and see the cross. I've been in many, many churches in my ministry over 40 years. And I want you to know that this one has particular meaning. I don't know what it is, and maybe you've experienced this too, but when I come in, I glance around. Of course, I look at people who's here, who's not here, and I enjoy this beautiful building in which we meet. But lifted high above us is perhaps the greatest symbol of the Christian faith. We know it as the cross. I, I did a little bit of research, tried to find out where this came from, this beautiful cross. And I couldn't find the answer. Apparently it's been here maybe since the beginning of this church. Now the lighting was added not too long ago, several years ago. But still it symbolizes something. And as we look into the text this morning, we're going to see what that cross symbolizes. Because you can go way back in the Old Testament, a long time before Jesus was born, and you see God giving us a glimpse, giving his people, at that time the nation of Israel, a picture of the cross. So I want you to gaze at the cross with me through the eyes of the Old Testament. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, there's a fascinating stories of how God blessed his people, how he delivered them from slavery to Egypt. He brought redemption to them, if you will. Again, a picture of Jesus Christ, who would come many, many years later, and people would be able to see with their own eyes the Son of God displayed in his glory here on earth. But we come in the book of Exodus to chapter 17. Now it's a fascinating scripture and I think it best if we follow along with me as I read it. And I'm beginning in verse 8 and reading to the end of the chapter in verse 16. So would you follow along with me in whatever version you have, whether on a tablet, a phone, or hardcover Bible, whatever it may be. In Exodus 17, beginning verse 8, the word of God says, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so that they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua so that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner, saying, a hand upon the throne of the Lord the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. That story is very, very significant for God's people were to remember something and more importantly, remember someone, as we'll see from the text. I like to study the scriptures when I'm preparing to preach and come up with what I consider a big idea. What is the big idea of this particular passage of Scripture? I suggest to you these words. Remember the cross and the finished work of Jesus 
whatever comes our way. Remember the cross and the finished work of Jesus, whatever comes our way. Now, when I study the scriptures as well, I like to study the context. It's important we understand this morning the context of this scripture passage. What is the context? We're now in the story of the nation of Israel, about two months out of slavery in Egypt. Some of you may well remember that story of Moses leading the people of God out from under slavery into the wilderness where they would wander around for 40 years. By the way, because of sin. Sin has consequences. But it was Moses who led the people. He was the deliverer sent by God for them. A reluctant deliverer, but nonetheless a deliverer sent by God. And about two months after that, they're now in the wilderness, the people. And there was a million, up to four million, some might say, of Israelites, followers of God, of the Lord. And here they are facing a test. Actually, in chapter 17 of Exodus, it's the second test that they were to face. God was testing their faith. Now, before we go any further, I want you to put that together. God delivers his people, and something happens in their lives. And they begin to test God. In fact, you see in verse 7, if you were to read that whole verse, which we won't, at the very end of it, there is a statement or a question, if you will, that God's people are asking. Is the Lord among us or not? Let me tell you that that is a powerful statement of emotion of people who are wondering, does God really care what we're going through? Does he really love us? Does he really show us his everyday grace? What's going on here? Well, the first part of chapter 17 is a test of their faith. You see, they were in the desert wandering around. And guess what? They got thirsty. <laughs> and they began to, to complain. I find that when God gives us spiritual highs in our life, oftentimes we respond in different ways. Let me suggest to you that there are at least three ways, there's more than that actually, but three ways in which God's people responded to this testing that's coming from God, and it's the testing of their faith. One is rumbling. There's rumbling in the camp of God. What's that all about? Rumbling is, let me put it this way, it's a way of saying my way is better. You ever thought about that in light of the COVID that we're going through? You ever thought that maybe you have a better way than some other people who may be on television, who may be trying to tell us what's happening? <laughs> maybe there's a temptation that we have to rumble about what's going on around us, to complain, to think that our way is better. That's one thing that can happen after a spiritual highs, because when you experience a great victory from God, a great blessing from God, you find yourself on the mountaintop saying, man, life doesn't get better than this. This is wonderful. But what happens, we're called back to live the everyday life where we are, and it's so easy for us to grumble and complain. Another response is resting. The use of names in Scripture is very instructive. For instance, this particular test of faith occurs in Rephidim. Now, the word Rephidim, the name Rephidim, stands for resting, places of rest. Supposedly, they're in a place of rest. 
There must have been some provisions there, but one thing we know, there wasn't any water. And one of the things that can happen when we experience spiritual highs is we want to just rest. <laughs> Can't you just wait until this pandemic is over <laughs> and we get back to life as normal? We want to rest. Well, we've been through so much, it's, it's time to rest. I've worked with a lot of churches as they search for new pastors or church plants as they find that first meeting place. And there, you, you can stand around them and hear a great sigh of relief. Now we can rest. You see, resting, a resting place can also be a place of testing the testing of our faith. Because life isn't good all the time. We can go through so much. And so the people of God were at Rephidim when this test came to them. They had just been supplied water by God. And they can rest. But no, life doesn't work that way. Another thing that can happen when you experience a spiritual high is you want to return back to the good old days and stay there. I'm trying to study hard to learn how we can best respond to what we've been going through for over the past year now and uh, let me submit to you that we will not go back to where we used to be. Life has been changed now. And I know as a church, because I, I work with churches that wrestle with this, and every church wrestles with this, what do we do? Can, can we go back to life as normal and do the things the way we've always done them? And let me share with you some news. <laughs> the answer is no. We have to learn what God has in store for us and what his future is for us as a church. And for you as an individual. Well, those are just three things. And out of that comes a warning. Don't try to live life the way it used to be. God may be preparing us for something far greater than we could ever imagine. What if out of this pandemic, worldwide pandemic, would come a worldwide revival? Because people realize that everything that's being done isn't quite working. We've got a new variant coming over here from Brazil. We've got a new one coming from Africa. And we, we have all this happening around us. Well, maybe God is testing our faith. And maybe he has planned something far greater than we could ever ask or imagine. According to his power that works within us. You see, when you experience a test from God, it's time to move forward. The question is, how do you do that? And let me submit to you that God in his wisdom has given us an experience. And what are we to experience here? I put it this way. And I, I look at this in terms of, of Three different examples for us to follow. One of the good questions you can ask when you study your Bible, particularly the Old Testament, is, is there an example here for me to follow? And I would submit to you that this text gives us three examples. The first is verses 8 through 11. And I would say it's this. Jesus' followers move forward on our knees. We're the only army that marches forward on our knees. And I'm speaking, of course, of prayer. For among other things, this particular passage of Scripture is a study of the importance of prayer. Prayer in the life of God's people, of praying together. But Jesus' followers move forward on our knees. And underneath that, I would say, don't give up. Don't give up praying. We're at war. This is a great text of spiritual warfare here as well. 
for it happens to be a time when Israel faces warfare for the first time. And you'll see from reading this text that they aren't really prepared for that. They aren't trained soldiers. They, they've lived in captivity. They've been slaves. They've been hard workers with their hands. But using a sword or a javelin, like the Amalekites, no, they're not, not there at all. Something interesting we discover when we dig deeply into this text is that the Amalekites attacked and targeted the weak. Now, who are the weak in the church? The weak are those who really need to read and study their Bible more. <laughs> the weak are those who are having difficulty growing in their Christian faith. It's oftentimes the weak that our enemy, Satan, and his demons attack. In those days, the enemy would come behind the people who were marching forward in the wilderness, and they would look for the stragglers, those who were ill, those who were sick, and he would attack them in order to destroy the people of God, the elderly, those who are really struggling and having difficulties, whatever it may be. And our church has had many of those recently. We need to understand that we need to march together in the battle against our enemy, but march on our knees to march in prayer. So here's a call to move forward. Look at verse 9. I think that verse 9 is telling us that we need to pray. We need to pray, especially those for those who lead God's people. Pray especially for our pastors and our deacons and others in the church who are in positions of leadership. Because this is a story about Moses and Aaron and her and Joshua, leaders in God's army. But we're going to see how God uses them to pray. I want you to notice that there's a mention of the staff of God here in the text that Moses used. This is the, the staff that he uses. I, I'd hoped to find one, but I couldn't find an adequate one to demonstrate this with. In fact, as we discuss this passage in preparation for today, the staff were quick not to volunteer to stand beside me on either side and hold my hands up for the whole sermon. But in this particular text, we need to understand something about prayer. Pray especially for those in positions of leadership, but pray. Now, you don't have to pray literally on your knees. Some of us are at the stage in life where it's difficult. Arthritis takes over. <laughs> and we can't get on our knees like we used to or like we want to. This is serious, down on knees kind of praying that is needed when it comes to going through the tests that God has for us. I think of a dear friend of mine. I helped him get started in planting a church in Leavenworth, Kansas. Now, why Leavenworth? Leavenworth is famous for its five prisons. Leavenworth is famous for having a major military army base there, for being the place for training of command officers from forces around the world. Literally, people from other countries all around the world come to that place as officers in the military to learn how to do battle against the enemy. Well, Colonel Sam Sanford, it's a dear friend. He's a retired chaplain now. And when he retired, he felt the call of God to help plant a church. And he felt led to go to Leavenworth, Kansas. What you need to know about Colonel Sam Sanford is that 
he's a well-known force in the military, and he still is to this day. Uh, Sam was given at one time a god rod, kind of a reflection upon Moses' instrument to use in leading God's people. A literal rod made out of a tree trunk, a limb, about six feet, maybe seven feet. And as Sam traveled around and as he met leaders and, and generals and colonels from around the world, he would be given a medal, a coin, if you will. Now, that's a common practice in the military. And he would put those coins on his rod, which became known as the God Rod. Well, it would be a symbol of his being a chaplain and a spiritual leader in the military all over the world. One thing about the God Rod, he, he had somebody suggest that he put on both ends of this rod a empty cartridge that had been used in battle. On one side would be a small arm cartridge, empty of course, and that would be on the top of the rod. And when asked what that was all about, he would say, well, that's for those little quick prayers that we often need to pray. <laughs> Lord, help. <laughs> Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Guide us, Lord. Give us wisdom. But on the bottom, he had a 50 caliber empty cartridge a heavy-duty armament in the military, a powerful weapon. He was asked what that is all about. He said, well, there are times when we have to do some very serious praying in order to win the battle and shoot up all we got to the Lord. And he carried that around with him. He was uh, sent on duty to the first Iraqi war. And then flying over, he was on a 747, and the plane was loaded with military. And he was there with his troops. And he had his god rod with him. The captain of the airplane, after a lengthy flight, came on and he says, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you will notice that we're now flying over the Red Sea. You gotta know Sam. But he immediately stood up from his plane seat, grabbed his god rod, held it high, and he said, we're crossing the Red Sea. <laughs> and guess what? I'm sure those in the cockpit wondered because the plane erupted with 400 plus soldiers screaming and shouting at the top of their lungs. We're crossing the Red Sea. What a voice of victory. What an encouragement. Well, I'll mention a little bit about him in just a moment. But look at verse 10. I want you to notice in verse 10 the combination of prayer and work. Did you hear me? Prayer and work. The two go together. We need to pray. But don't just pray that God does all the work. Pray that God might use you and me in that work and be an answer to our prayers. You see that in the New Testament as you study the work of Jesus. You can't separate them. Many of you have heard of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. Brooklyn Tabernacle was in the state of disrepair. It's in downtown Brooklyn. And it was literally had holes in the roof and it was falling apart. When a young man and his wife, Jim and Carol Simbala, sensed that God wanted them to go there and pastor that church. Had 12, 15 members in it. That was all. Well, he wrestled with God in prayer about that and God convicted him that yes, he was to go. Now, did Jim have seminary training? No. Did he have Bible college training? No. <laughs> did he have experience? No. It was just that quiet voice of God in answer to prayer saying, 
go where I'm calling you. And so God led him there, and he became the pastor. Well, he got so discouraged after a while, he, he told one reporter, he said, there are more people coming to get cocaine than there are coming to find Christ here. And he got so discouraged that he was ready to quit. But you know what? He kept praying. God showed up. And God said, I want you here, and I want you to make this church a church of prayer. Now, whether God spoke through his word, I, I don't know how God spoke to him, but he was now under conviction. So he came and shared that with his people in the church. And do you know what happened? He had his first prayer meeting. He had 12 members show up for it. He called it for a Tuesday night, and 12 people showed up, and they prayed earnestly for five minutes, and then they were done. <laughs> and they went home. But he kept on praying and calling people to pray. And that was back in the 1980s. Today, 10,000 people attend that church. Pastor Jim is still there. And that has become a church of prayer around the world. God was at work. And he continues to be at work in marvelous ways. You know, today in their prayer meeting, the prayer meeting is scheduled for 7 o'clock. At 5 o'clock, people start to show up in order to pray for the prayer meeting. By 7 o'clock, they have 3,000 people in downtown Brooklyn, New York, ready to pray. Now, God may not choose to do that at every church, but one of the things that God may be calling us to do in the middle of all this COVID stuff is to really learn how to pray and to pray earnestly. And maybe this is going to be a season of prayer, particularly as we approach Easter. But what's happening in verses 10 and 11 of this text? Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. You see the picture there? There's a secret to prayer. When you pray, God gets the victory, and we get to join him in that. If we don't pray, we can lose the battle. Now, we haven't lost the war. Read the rest of the Bible for that. But what can happen if we do not pray? We can lose the battle. Now keep that in mind because the text goes on as we get in verse 12 and 13. The lesson here to learn, the example to follow, is that Jesus' followers go together into the battle. Now this is crucial. They go together into the battle. Not just the most spiritual ones, but the whole army unites together in prayer. And when Moses' hands grew weary, the scripture says, Aaron and Hur were right there, leaders, helping to hold his arms up. And as long as he held that rod up, victory. But when he got tired, by the way, he was 80 years old at the time. When he got tired... In about a 12-hour day, in the heat of the desert, they were there to hold him up. In fact, they brought a big old stone for him to sit on. That would probably be their equivalent of a recliner for us. <laughs> Get some rest, Moses, but keep praying. Keep praying. Don't stop. You see, don't give up and don't go it alone. It's a big part of the secret behind effective prayer. God does his part, but we must do ours. Moses couldn't do it alone. One of the negative impacts of this whole COVID thing is that we've lost the ability to connect face-to-face, -face, literally. We wear masks so that we can protect others. We wear masks, and we lose the ability to meet. In fact, we have to do social distancing. We're supposed to in order to help others 
keep them from getting any infection. But what we're seeing here is we've lost something. How will we get, regain that part, which is fellowship? Well, the Lord wants to teach us something, and we need to trust him in prayer. So how about we as a church begin to pray seriously, Lord, how can we do this? Scriptures say that the New Testament church was devoted to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, the breaking of bread and to prayer. I believe it's one of Satan's weapons to try to keep us away from God's priorities. And we're to go into this battle together. Don't try it alone. There's only one way we're going to come through this pandemic, and it's together in prayer. That's the only way. And that's the advantage of the church. The government doesn't have that. No organizations, no hospital, no clinic has that. We have prayer. And our lives are in the hands of God. And we need to trust him and learn to pray in this. The result of going into battle together is victory. And it says here that Joshua overwhelmed the enemy. Do you know this is the first mention of Joshua in the Old Testament? Joshua. Yehoshua. We know that name. It's the name Jesus. Joshua becomes a symbol of Jesus in the middle of the battle with all of us, gaining victory. We need to look to our Lord. And this is where we begin to look and gaze at the cross. And what do we learn from that? Remember the text, and it was even mentioned last week in the message, Romans 8, 37. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. What do you see when you gaze at the cross? Can you imagine the people on the battlefield, the, the army of God's people had been gathered as they looked up on top of that hill or that mountain and saw Moses with the rod of God in his hand, which symbolizes the presence of God and the power of God. Can you imagine them? I can, I can almost hear them shouting as they, as they grow weary and they look up. Is he still there? Is God with us? And they see that rod of God held high with the help of Aaron and her teamwork in prayer. This is the only way the church is going to march forward rather than backward. Jesus' followers go together into battle. We don't go it alone. Prayer is hard work. But it works. Marty and I really appreciate your prayers through what we've just gone through. As you can see, my wife is with me today. After a cancer diagnosis back in November, she had some very serious surgery that was done. She was meeting in a post-op appointment with Dr. Kaufman and discussing with him. And he was connecting with her and asking her, why did she move so much around? And she said, well, my husband is a pastor. And as they talked, she mentioned, you don't realize this, doctor, but people all over the country have been praying for you as you did that surgery. I love that, Marty. And he said, well, maybe that's why it was so easy. I don't know whether he's a believer or not, but he heard a testimony there of the importance of prayer and how God used that. The result of going into battle together is victory. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Well, look at the end of this text, and that's Exodus 14, or 17, 14 through 16. You see, in that text, there's a story of how when you gaze upon the Lord and his work, his finished work, even a symbol of his finished work, you begin to see God gaining the victory. And how does he do this? Here's the secret behind victorious prayer, friends. It's 
if we remember what God has already done, that's the basis for our prayers. Remembering what he has already done. God's people had a very short memory. We have short memories. But these are days in which we need to remember the faithfulness of God in answer to our prayers, in answer to our hard work for him and what we're seeking to do and accomplish for him. You cannot forget what Jesus did for you on the cross of Calvary. You see, a, an altar was set up, an altar of stones. And that was the thing that they did back in those days. But listen to me briefly as you look at that cross and we'll hear the real secret behind what we've been talking about today. What is the symbol of the cross? If you study the scriptures, this is what you'll hear. That Christ died on the cross once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Because of that cross, you are declared forgiven from your sins when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. On that cross, Jesus became your substitute. You deserve to be there, not Jesus. On that cross, Jesus made it possible for you to be freed from not only the penalty and punishment of sin, but the power of sin over your life. Because of that cross and the death of the one who died for you, you can be reconciled to God, your heavenly Father, by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because of the finished work of Christ on that cross, you can now have peace with God. That old empty cross is the great symbol that Jesus is alive today because he conquered sin and death. Dying on that cross at Calvary, Jesus showed you how very much he loves you. It wasn't just a symbol like that God rod was but it's all about the finished work of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, his saving work for you is finished because of the cross. And he said with his last words on the cross, it is finished. You cannot, you cannot earn grace. We are saved by grace through faith and that in Jesus Christ. The cross is lifted up for you. Lift it up. Lift it high in your own life so that people can see what you're all about. We're going to close by singing the power of the cross. As you sing, I hope you listen carefully to the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's leaving behind much more than a pile of stones which were a place of the altar of God but it's leaving behind our lives with Christ lived in us through others. So worship team, would you lead us in this beautiful song as we sing? to see the dawn of the darkest day Christ on the road to Calvary tried by sinful men torn and beaten then nailed to a cross of wood oh the power of the cross Christ became sinful 
Thank you, Lord, that we're not in this alone. We're in this together. We are your people, your followers. We thank you for the symbol of the cross. In this particular season, we look forward to that great celebration. So thank you, Lord. Send us now with your presence and your power because of that cross and because it's all about Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen.